In chapter 1, Paul didn't hesitate to say some strong things about Crete and the culture of Crete and how some of the values and ways of life represented in that community differ from what believers are called to. And so he said Christians should live out their faith in a way that's pretty striking. But in chapter 3, he's going to say, there are some guidelines I want to give that help us relate well with those around us. Even though we believe differently, even though we live differently, how can we represent Christ well in our community? And so he begins chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, saying, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceful and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. So he starts by talking about rulers and authorities and the fact that there are still local and regional governments that the, the believers need to be attentive to. And he says, respect them, be subject to them. Christianity, while it is in some cases very disruptive to our lives personally, may even cause problems with our family if our families aren't believers, maybe is disorienting for our coworkers, it is not primarily about overthrowing the empire. And Paul and his companion Titus and the people in the church in Crete need to figure out a way to navigate life in the Roman Empire and in the community of Crete in a way that was peaceful. And so he says, be respectful to the leadership. Don't go out of your way to cause problems. Now, of course, if our loyalty to Jesus ever puts us at odds with the loyalty that someone is asking of us from the government, we have to go with Jesus. But in many of the mundane parts of life, as as a participant in a society, we can fit in. And when it comes to our character, we don't fit in. But when it comes to our manner of relating and navigating life in a society, we can fit in. And he says, so be subject to the rulers and be peaceable, be considerate, be gentle towards everyone. Let it be the case that your neighbors and your coworkers there in Crete uh, have a pleasant time interacting with you. And while you're making some choices for your life, that might vary greatly from theirs, they say, but we can relate peaceably with each other. And he goes on, in, starting in verse 3, to maybe explain some of how we can empathize with those around us, even if they are far from God. He says, don't remember, don't forget, verse 3, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. He gives a sort of spiritual biography of every human being. And while some of us might not have as dramatic of a background as someone else, from, a, from God's perspective, each and every one of us, at some point, were separated from him because of sin. And Paul says we can characterize that by foolishness. There's things we didn't know. We didn't know God. We didn't know who Jesus was. We had to learn those things. We were disobedient. Even the things we knew, we went against them. And each and every one of us can think of at some point in our lives where we knew what we ought to do, but we didn't do it. We were deceived. So some of the things that we knew were distorted or had gaps in it. And at some point, we had to learn the truth about God and his will. And we were enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. So it's not just our mind that was lacking. It's actually our heart and our will that was against the things of God and was enslaved by sin. We couldn't seem to help but do the things that go against God's will. This is all of us in, in varying degrees before we put our faith in Christ. And so that can give us a certain humility and, and empathy for those around us, even if they are themselves not believers. It's part of how we can feel motivated to feel peaceful, peaceable and considerate of them, is to understand I came from the same place that they are. And while this portrayal and, and sketch of our life before Christ is not too favorable, he's, he matches that portrait with an even greater portrait of what the grace of God accomplishes for us. And he says, even though these things of foolishness, of disobedience, deception, and, and enslaver, enslavement characterize our life before Christ, even greater things character our lives, or characterize our lives after Christ. In the malice and envy, the division and hostility we felt towards other people prior to our transformation in Christ, 
is engulfed by a new way of looking at God, new way of looking at ourselves, new way of looking at each other. So in verse 4, he says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So he describes our salvation as an expression of kindness from God appearing, not because we did anything to engender his kindness, not because we were righteous, but he frankly had pity on us. The word mercy here means he looked at us in our situation and he says, I feel sorry for them. Now, God loves us deeply. God made us. God knows us. And he knows that outside of his own grace, his own mercy, we are hopeless. And so he meets us there in that through Christ our Savior. He saved us not because of the righteous things we did, but he does this through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, verse 5. Hopefully, John 3 comes to our minds where Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot have this eternal life. You cannot participate in this new kingdom that that I'm creating. And so, you have to be born again. Well, here Paul explains theologically that it is a work of the Holy Spirit to give us that rebirth and that renewal through his divine power. God gives us this new spirit within us that we could have never manufactured on our own. And this was an expression of generosity through Christ our Savior, verse 6. And so, washing of rebirth and renewal, verse 7, justified by his grace, which means now we are considered not guilty as opposed to guilty, and we've been given the power it takes to live a life that actually looks righteous moving forward. We've been justified by his grace so that we might become heirs having the, having the hope of eternal life. So we go from disobedient, deceived, foolish, enslaved to reborn, justified, and now heirs. The language of heir uh, makes makes us think of adoption, that God now brings us in so close, not that we just get to sort of merely be his servants on the fringe of of his property, but that we were brought all the way into his home and that he gives us the same status as his own son. And of course, there will always be a uniqueness to the relationship between the Father, Son, and Spirit. But notice how how the the Spirit has been given to us and we are counted as his sons, that we are made heirs. Everything that comes to his son comes to us. The rights and privileges of his one and only son are now granted because of our faith in him and reception of his grace. They're granted to us. His destiny is our destiny. Where he goes, we go. And so this profound gift is described in these lofty theological terms. And frankly, we could spend much more time just thinking about this rebirth, justification, and being appointed as heirs. But Paul gives us this spiritual biography. Maybe we didn't think of ourselves in these terms, but he helps us to overlay this imagery to understand the journey we have made, pre-Christ and in Christ. And hopefully that actually helps, gives us a disposition towards the rulers and authorities, to, to, toward those who are in our community and say, I was just like you once. And hopefully it also gives us cer- a certain confidence to say, but you can be like I am. Not that I'm so smart, not that I'm so holy, but that I have been reborn, justified, and made an heir of God's kingdom. And you can be too. And so that's why in verse eight, he says, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things. Maybe a better translation would be, I want you to state these things with confidence. It's a confidence that we can have not in ourselves, but in what Christ has done. To say, this is the good news that everybody needs. Kings, authorities, my neighbors, my coworkers, my family. And my confidence doesn't come from my righteousness, but from his great kindness that's been shown to me. He's, been, he's made me new. 
He's taken my spiritual biography and absolutely radically shifted it to this new way, this new destiny, this new status before him. And so hopefully that gives us this confidence. He says, he ends verse eight by saying, so that having trusted in God, we may be careful. It, it might even be better to translate that, that we keep thinking about these things so that we can devote ourselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So in the midst of a conversation about how to relate well to our society, he says, remember your testimony. Remember the fact that God has absolutely radically transformed your life and is in the process of transforming it. And that is the message that we share with the whole world. This, that is the hope that every single human being can have if they too would be willing to be reborn, justified, and appointed as an heir of Christ. And so state these things with confidence. And I want to challenge you to be confident in your witness. I want you to, to feel bold to go out and share this good news with the world. Not because you're so smart, not because you're so good, but because God is so smart and God is so good and his kindness has been generously poured out onto us. So let's feel empowered to relate peaceably and kindly with our environment, not to feel on the defense or or to be to be at odds with our environment, but to be peaceful so that we can get this message out because this message is the hope of the world and God in his kindness has made it available to us through the work of the Spirit and through the work of Christ. So let's go share it. <music>